Welcome to the Workshop Therapy Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew, and joining me today is Mr. Bruce Ulrich. How are you doing today, Bruce? How are you doing well? Good. So, thanks for coming on, first and first and foremost. And uh, sorry for the run around this week. My, my schedule <laughs> has been absolutely crazy. But, but yeah, so in the pre-show, we were talking about house designs and stuff. And, and uh, Bruce, you're, you're building a house in Kentucky, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're in central and, Kentucky. And uh, yeah, we were just having complaints. And so we started talking about building my house. And I've had a bunch of questions about the, the SIPS panels that I'm using. So structural insulated panels. And so I thought maybe this is how we should start the show because, you know, why not? I'm not that familiar with those. Are, are they like the, uh, I've seen those uh, ICFs maybe, like insulated concrete forms? Yeah, so so ICFs, they're, they're like the, the big Lego blocks that you pour concrete in the middle of them, right? Mm-hmm. So SIPs, structural insulated panels, they're basically styrofoam with OSB sheets on the outside. That's right. I saw that the, on your Instagram and I was asking you about it. Yeah, quite a few people asked me about it. But yeah, so basically what they are is they're just big CNC cut panels. I think you can build like a single panel up to like 10 feet by 30 feet or something like that. And and so you have... And you can go up to 12 inches thick on them. Mine are, mine are six and a half inches thick. So just kind of like a standard two by six wall thickness. Mm-hmm. But then it's got just solid foam all the way through. And then there's... I, I don't know exactly what the interior structure looks like. But but they put headers inside of above the windows and and kind of appropriate bracing and then they engineer they engineer the wall to include the the OSB and the foam as part of the structure. Oh, that's what I was going to ask if it was only a, a sheathing or or insulation method or if it was actually part of the structure. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a full structure all in <laughs> and of itself. But the the advantage is is that you don't have any. Um, you don't have any thermal bridging between the interior and the exterior. Right. And so you get you get less conductive heat loss. The the biggest downside to them though, especially up north here, is because there's such a massive temperature gradient between the inside and the outside when it's super cold. Mm-hmm. You have a you have a really hard tendency for vapor drive through any air leakage. Right. Condensation. And beca- yeah, and because they're because they're a, I mean, basically a, a continuous air and moisture barrier all the way through the wall. If you get any vapor penetration in there, there's no way for it to dry out. Mm. And so if you don't air seal everything really well and make sure you got everything set up properly as, as far as rain screens and and uh, all that type of stuff, your your water resistive barriers and all that type of thing. If you don't have that done right, you can screw yourself over really bad. Because, hmm. because unlike a, a traditional wall where you go, oh, I have a rotten stud. Let's pull off the drywall and put a new right. stud in and, and move on. Right? You can't do that. No, it's you all basically. One thing. Oh no, I have. Yeah, you're. You're. Oh no, I have to replace my entire wall. <laughs> but uh, uh, what kind of R value does that provide? Do they list it like that? They do. So the the R value, the R value is foam. Foam is like, oh, what is it, five and a half, six per inch? Yeah, I was going to say something like that. So the so the R value is code compliant on the six and a half inch thick wall. Okay, so it'd be thirty plus. Uh, it's, I think it's. I think bare minimum is like twenty eight. I think is what, and I think my wall is rated to like thirty one. We I don't remember. have to have, have that to, high here. Well, but but here's the here's the thing about about this. So the thing about foam, and this is what I've been learning here recently, foam versus fiberglass, right? Like you have to treat them differently because as as fiberglass gets colder, it actually loses our value. Mm. And so and so what happens is the reason that that insulation codes are what they are is because they're based on on fiberglass insulation. Mm. And so when you have X amount of fiberglass inf- insulation you have to have, you know, six inches to perform like three inches at minus 20 or minus 30. Gotcha. 
whereas foam insulation, it's the same R value regardless of the temperature. You get you get kind of a minimal loss as it gets colder, hmm. and so it performs differently. I I don't know personally, but I've talked to a bunch of people who who use spray foam and and fiberglass, and they say that that two and a half inches of foam insulation is the equivalent of six inches of fiberglass insulation. Wow. Yeah, I'm seeing more and more people do the spray foam even here. And a couple of the builders I talked to, one of them said, by the time you calculate labor to put up bat insulation, you know, like the old traditional bat insulation, it's actually more expensive than the spray foam. Even though the spray foam is, the product is a little more expensive, they can come and do an entire house in like an afternoon. Yeah. And the batting, you know, someone has to put those in each bay and staple it up and do all of that. And the, the labor is what ends up eating you up. Yeah. And then you have to put a vapor barrier over top of it and the whole. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that, and that's that jives. I've got, I don't know, half a dozen different quotes for insulating my house. And and that's fiberglass or the, the, the spray foam always came in a little bit more, but not not enough more to be like oh my goodness that's such a big difference enough more that you're like yeah let's do it yeah it's like because because on top of that you get in my mind one of the biggest advantages of of spray foam insulation is is you get an air barrier and a and a moisture barrier all in one one coat right so you don't right. have to you don't have to come back and you don't have to staple anything on you don't have to you don't have to go with your can of spray foam and find all the air leaks and, and spray yeah. them off because that's the majority of your majority of your heat loss is actually air movement, right? Yeah, that's the other thing it does well is seal up all of those little spots that you usually get air leaks. Yeah, I was reading in, I think it was a fine home building, it might have been the green building advisor, but they were talking about if you, if you take kind of like a standard stick frame house without air sealing and and add up all of the the air leakage it's essentially like leaving like a three foot wide hole open in your wall whoa yeah i was like that's that's actually a really significant amount of air movement but you might be interested i don't know if you ever watch uh matt reisinger on youtube yeah he does a lot of he i don't watch a ton of his stuff but you know in the last couple of years looking into home building and stuff he he interviews different builders and, and that are doing some interesting things. That's where I first found out about like the zip system or some of these other things. It's, it's weird because, you know, in home building, the, the guys that are good at it and have been doing it a long time, it can also be a negative, even, even though like they can build a good house and this and that, well, they're hesitant to use new building materials, new methods. You know what I mean? And so you get yeah, some of these guys know. like they have 30 years experience and they can build an awesome house, but it's like, they won't touch. I, I just keep saying zip system. Cause we've talked about it. They won't touch that or they won't touch, you know, what you're talking about, those, the foam walls. And it may be a superior product, but you know, they just, I don't know. They, they don't look into it. And then some of the younger guys coming up, sure. Maybe they've not built as many houses, but they're willing to look at some of these things that are way more efficient even though the material like spray foam, I mean, some of the old school guys just won't really do that. There's one builder that we like probably the most. He does a, I don't even know what it's called, but you basically put a netting on the inside of the, of the studs and create a bay. And then you fill that. I think it's like a oh, blown yeah. cellulose. Yeah. Dense pack cellulose. Yeah. And it, yeah. it does a really good job of insulating. I can't see how, it seems labor intensive to me still because you have to put up that netting. Yeah, but it's dirt cheap. That's the thing. It's essentially ground up newspaper. Yeah. Right. And so so the the product itself is really cheap. That was the other actually. So we, we went back and forth about what way we wanted to go. It's kind of my goal. Are you familiar with passive house standards at all? No, I'm not. So passive house standards are, are are like a global standard on on energy efficiency for the house, mm-hmm. and so they have certain levels that you have to meet in order to to qualify for the like ultimate energy efficiency, basically, right? Like their their bare minimum is an R forty wall, 
mm. and our ceiling. Wow. So it, it, it's like pretty, pretty. And yeah, then they have all there. sorts of air sealing things and, and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's all about minimizing your your energy footprint and, and stuff, right? And then the, the downstream effect of that is if you have an R40 wall and an R100 roof, you then don't have to have, you can have half the size of, of uh, HVAC system. Oh, right? yeah. So you don't have to work as hard. Yeah, exactly. Because it, because you're losing 1% of your heat instead of 20% of your heat, right? So you just don't, you can heat your house with a candle instead of, instead of a furnace. Right. The, the downside I could see to some of that, to me, is similar to something like, I don't know, solar panels, which if you had the money up front, sure, it might be a good idea. But at a certain point, you just don't have the upfront capital to do this extra stuff. Yes, it will save you energy in the next 20 years. Nobody li- I mean, you and I are probably different, but nobody lives in a house for 20 years anymore. But I don't know. Some of this stuff, it's like at a certain point, you have to just say, OK, this is this is as good as we're going to get. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's I don't know where to, that point is. Yeah. It's going to, it's going to cost me, it's going to cost me $2,000 a month for the rest of my house ownership. And do I pay $2,000 a month into my mortgage or do I pay $1,000 a month into my mortgage and $1,000 a month into my utility bills? Right. Right. And, but yeah, that's, but that was, that was kind of what, where our thought process went down is, is like, we, we thought about doing like a double stud wall and doing a 12 mm-hmm. inch thick wall and then doing dense pack cellulose into it. That would be a lot. It would, it basically passive house standards is what we were going for. And, and then like going back and forth, eventually, eventually kind of settled on, okay, never mind. Let's do these sips because the, 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 the main reason that we decided to go sips is because I'm doing my, I'm working on my floor deck right now. I've got, I'm going to start putting my, my sub floor on tomorrow, hopefully. Um, yeah, I didn't know how real time that was. I saw your video the other day and I know my videos, the release of those lag a good bit from what I'm doing in real life. Yeah, I'm, I'm basically just scrambling on everything all the time. So it's just like, if I, if I, if I take a video, I'll just get it done and post it and, and move on. Yeah. Right, like I don't spend a whole lot of time editing it at this point, but anyway, yeah. So I get my get my subfloor down now, and once my subfloor is done, I'll be able to put up my walls and roof in probably about four days. I'll have a I'll have a dried in house. I I believe that because with the sips you're talking about, it looks like it'll go fast, and the uh, trusses I built a twenty foot by thirty foot tractor shed recently and i had trusses for those and you know you can't do it by yourself you got to have a couple people there helping you but the setting the posts and um like getting all that set and the trusses is the only thing i had help with on that building but we did the trusses in an afternoon now your yeah. house is a little larger but once you already have the trusses they're all numbered like especially for engineered trusses they're numbered you just put them in order yeah well and and the way i'm going to do my roof this this hopefully this will make an interesting video because I don't see any I don't see very many people doing this but so what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out I'm going to lay out my trusses on the ground I'm going to set a couple beams down 16 foot beams down and then I'm going to build my roof on the ground hmm. sheet it in for the most part and then I'm going to pick it up with a crane and set it up on the on the walls you don't think it'll so, shift enough even just with that little bit of flexing you think the the sheathing will hold it? Yep. I, yeah, I well, mean, sheathing I does a ton. I've... People don't realize what lateral uh, stabilization sheathing does. That's why you sh- sheet a house. I mean, it's yeah. what gives I mean, it I'm all its lateral strength. I mean, I'm not going to do the whole, the whole 36-foot section of roof at a time, just like a 16-foot section. So there's only there's only that much space. And so it'll be fine. I'm the the uh, So my brother built his house. <laughs> That's how he did his roof. And then the people who the people who are going to help me with my roof are neighbors. They have a they have a thirty two ton crane, which is why I'm going to do it this way. Wow! And so they that's how they are. You familiar with Hutterites at all? Mm-mm. Mennonites. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so the Hutterites are kind of an off, well, you go back a couple hundred years, Hutterites, Mennonites, and Amish, they're yeah. all kind of the same the same origin. Yeah, we've got the, some the Amish here, quite a few of, of the fr- framers around here, are Amish. Yeah, so that the, so the Hutterites they're they're kind of another offshoot of them and they they came up here and they're they're communal living farmers basically. Mm. But there's a yeah, there's a Hutterite colony up from us and they have they they've done my did you see my concrete video? Mm-mm. I need to go my check it out. And stuff. Yeah, they have a they have a on demand cement mixer basically. You got wow. three big hoppers in it with sand, gravel and cement powder. And you and a and a water tank on it, and you just turn it on, and it kind of you can mix however much you want. Basically, that's crazy. Yeah, I think up to twelve yards is what they have capacity for on the truck. And then, that's a pretty decent amount. Uh, in twelve yards, I think that's about a normal truckload full. Yeah, yeah, it's about that. And uh, so, yeah, but but yeah, you can just. You know, you can mix a couple shovelfuls up to the full truck. And it doesn't, but, that's cool because with them all being separate, it doesn't spoil that way. It's not already pre-mixed. Yeah, exactly. It's not actually mixed until it gets, so So basically they got these big hoppers and then it, it dumps down onto a conveyor belt and the conveyor belt brings it into a little mixing hopper that dumps down into the, into the chute. I've so, never seen anything like that. I'll have to go check it out. Didn't know that yeah, existed. So the the waste the waste if you if you mix too much, it's basically like three shoops, scoop shovel fulls is all you lose. That's not bad. Yeah, so it's pretty good. But any, anyway, so they have that, and then they have a they have a spray foam rig. Really, and and they have this crane and stuff, and they build their they build all their own houses on their colony and stuff, and so that's how they build their roofs. They build them in six feet, sixteen foot sections. Pick them up, set them on next section, next section. And so I that's assume the, that's always a gable roof, right? And they can't yeah. do a hip roof like that. No, well, I don't know if you can or not, but they don't, and I'm not uh, going to. Mine's just going to be all just straight gable on both yeah. both levels. I see more gables here in Kentucky. It's interesting because we lived in Central Mississippi before this really different styles of you wouldn't think that's that different it's about about 400 miles north but the the architectural styles are very different but also not just the looks like the the actual way that things are built are so different and some of that i'm sure is weather dependent and some of it's just like well this is how we've always done it you know so but in mississippi the hip roofs are really popular they kind of have that french acadian style i'll call it and yeah. the last house we built down there, it was a giant hip roof. And there was just so much roof because it, it comes down on every side if, if people aren't familiar with the hip roof. So it basically, if you had a square house, you would have a section of roof that came down to the gutter on all four sides. Whereas yeah, you a gable have end, a flat top pyramid on top of your house. Correct. But our the soils there move a lot. And so people don't do basements and it's not as popular even to do uh two story if you have the room. So we had almost an acre so we could kind of build what we wanted as far as a sprawling house plan. So the house plan was all one level except for a bonus room over the garage. But that, that meant that the roof was just this sprawling hip roof. I mean, looking back, I'm like, man, that was a lot of money we could have used for something else, you know, to, to not have this style that everyone thinks I don't know. I'm over that. I want a house to look good, like we were talking about in the pre-show, but I'm I'm over the building this house for someone else. I was never real big on building the house to show it off or, you know, whatever, but I'm I'm really over that at this point. I want it to look good, sure. I want it to look nice from the street. And people often confuse that with, oh, well, you're just going to put up something that looks like a shed or this or that. No, that's not my intention at all. I want it to look good, but... I'm not building it so that it'll be in a showcase of homes. It doesn't matter to me. Yeah. That's well, that's one of the reasons that we, we went with the design that we did for my preference when it comes to roofs, more hips and valleys in it. That's just more potential leak spots. Yep. Right. Like there, there's something to be said for just a simple, you know, six twelve pitch or three twelve pitch, whatever you want straight along done. 
right? Yeah. You're yeah, just, I actually prefer just the it... lower pitch roofs now, uh, just because if you have to get up there, you can actually get up there. I mean, our last one that I was telling you that we built in Mississippi, that the style was like a really steep pitch. I couldn't even get up on parts of the roof because it was probably like a like a ten twelve or something like that. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, mine's going to be a six twelve, which is kind of getting up to, you know, what is that? That's twenty two and a half degrees, I think. Yeah, that's that's getting getting pretty steep. Yeah, but yeah, well, so that's you kind of like that borderline space, where I'd want to climb on. But it, for you to have that usable space up in the attic you were talking about, you basically have to have that. Because if you go much lower pitch, that just eliminates that height. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and that's why we actually put it up into there is just because my initial quote on the on the rafters was just regular ra- regular trusses. And uh, and then I started thinking about it. I was like, there's enough space there that we could put an attic in. And so then I, I had them re-engineer my trusses. And turns out that I can get this this 12 by 36 foot long by 7 feet high space in my attic. Hmm. And so then it's like for an extra three grand oh, that's an on easy. my trusses. Yeah, easy yeah. sell. That's a no-brainer on that one. And then and so then the because because I just have basically two flat roofs too, right? Or two straight roofs mm-hmm. on the lower level in order to access the attic, there there's a there happens to be a walk-in closet right on dead center of of the lower section of roof. Hmm. And so I just engineered in a door there. So you just walk through the walk-in closet into the attic and and you have 460 square feet of storage space that's definitely worth it um i hate those pull down stairs but we had a walk-in at our last house i was telling you where we put a lot of storage up there of course (laughs) it was too hot i think we were talking about that in the pre-show but um the walk-in so worth it i mean I'm I'm pretty tall, so going up through any of that stuff or like the little half doors that some people put in for the attic, it's just a nightmare. I'd rather just put a standard door in, then I can just walk into the attic and get what I need. Yeah. I think I think I'm gonna have to custom build the door because I think I don't think I put a full height door into it. I didn't think about it until afterwards. So I think I have like a five and a half foot door, which you my wife can just walk in and out just fine, but right. I'm gonna have to duck. You could just change the jam, I guess on on the fly no i can't actually because it's uh because it's an exterior wall there it's one of the at one of the sips and uh, so it's it is what it is gotcha but that's actually speaking of sips there's there <coughs> that's the downside but my one regret is i made a cost decision saving decision on them i went with i went with a company called premier sips out of out of somewhere in Seattle area, I forget exactly where. Everett, I think maybe. Anyway, there, but there's a company closer to me that they're called Magwall, and they do a magnesium board panel on the outside and the inside instead of OSB. But it was another thirteen thousand for the same, basically same house. But I kind of regret not just paying for that because then it was it rot proof right so if there was Uh, moisture infiltration then i'd be like oh well is what it is Mm -hmm. but anyway one of the other things we were talking about in the pre-show was i was saying that i'm we're now having to revisit these custom plans that i had drawn to see you know if we can make some changes Great. But like you start looking at a few things and, and you make changes. Well, there's some things, okay, you might save 10 grand. Well, I need to save way more than that. I'm way off of where I want to be. I, I'm like 200 grand off of where we want to be as far as our project. So like I need to be making big savings. That's what I was talking about. And let me, you know, we'll just park back outside. We'll chop off this 16 feet by 47 or whatever that part of the wood shop was going to be. And I'll just use, I'll just take that wall out that was going to be the car parking and I'll have a a two car bay and then basically a a double one behind that also. So that'll be plenty. Still more than I have right now. I'm in a 21 by 21 two car garage. I don't know if you could park two cars in here, but. Smart cars. (laughs) Do what? Smart cars. Yeah. Yeah. I've uh, I've bought bigger machines since I was in the last shop. My last shop was bigger, 
But when we moved, I sold some of those and was like, oh, this is a good opportunity to upgrade machines. I have like bigger machines than I ever have. I have a 20 inch floor standing planer. I have a bigger, you know, three horsepower table saw. I have a giant laser in there. I have the CNC. I have a bigger bandsaw. The last bandsaw was a lot smaller. So it's like everything I've put in this shop that's smaller is bigger. But I was thinking if I did that to that shop, it it would probably save over a hundred thousand. The other thing that we were looking at doing, so we wanted to have a walkout basement. So basically it would have a, a door on one side that you basically have a little patio there that you could just walk in and walk out. I, I mean, it's a nicety and it would be nice, but then I started looking at what all you'd have to do with excavation and, and dirt. You know, it's on the lower end of the hill. You have to do it that way because we're building on a hill. Uh, we have a lot of rolling hills here. They're kind of the, the leftovers from the Appalachian Mountains. Like we don't have the mountains right here where I am, but if you go, I don't know, about an hour east of here, you do. So we're kind of, I guess, foothills. Um, but if I eliminate that walkout basement, I don't know that we care that much. Obviously, we won't get any natural light in there if we do that. But we weren't going to get much anyway because that door faced east. So after about noon, it was going to be pretty dark down there anyway. And if we change that, it changes you know, how we have to do that footer wall because we're not putting a door in there. It's, it's an easier one. And then the biggest change... I think would be having to do the, um, what is it called? Like a, like a barrier wall, you know, to keep the earth from moving and collapsing back over it. You have to do that yeah, on both sides. Wall. Yeah. Retaining wall. Thank you. You have to do that on both sides. And then most people don't like the looks of a lot of those retaining walls. So then they skin it with a brick or a stone or something else. So there's another cost. And then you have the pavers, you know, or, or concrete down there. But I think that could save another significant amount if we just, eliminate the walkout basement we could still have the basement but it's just just earth graded you know final grade the way we want it yeah and it becomes the prison to throw your children in when they're bad yeah yeah that's not a bad idea yours are you may not be able to to think like this but my 14 year old son this year he's now he's done that shoot up grow up thing like in a year it seems like i have a video of him just from last fall and it looks like a different kid you know he's now almost 5'10 he's taller than my wife you know he's wearing like a men's size 10 shoe and all this happened basically since christmas but i say all that to say as well yeah it's changing so fast Um, the uh so we were talking about these quotes i was getting I was leaving the basement unfinished. And the idea behind that was the main level has everything that we need. Really. It would have the two boys still sharing a room. Um, I don't know really what the teenager thinks about that, but we've talked about him getting his own room and this and that. And my eight year old that shares a room with him the other day said something like, I don't want Alan to have a different room. I, I would, I would miss him. So I'm like, well, that's sweet. You know, so who knows, maybe they'll stay, but we did it three bedrooms so that we could have everybody comfortable on the main level. And then I could work on doing some finishing of the basement later. Like even if with the construction loan, we could get it up through like finished drywall. I I can drywall. I just hate it. My joke is that even drywall guys hate drywall. (laughs) That's not a joke. Probably not a joke. I mean, it's messy. There's so much dust and I wish we could find some other kind of building material that was standardized at this point, but it's just, ubiquitous you know everybody uses that but if i could i mean i can finish rooms i can work on a bathroom and a bedroom to get alan down there you know in a in a bedroom and then work on the rest of it as i need to and i thought it might be some some content i could get out of it anyway but so far it just hasn't turned into that the the economy has really (laughs) changed from about three years ago when we moved here and started you know making all these plans so we kind of just had to park a lot of that on the side yeah i hear you that's i mean the only reason that we're building a house even is just because our last two houses we managed to get a pretty good return on what we paid for them and yeah and part of that is because like my my the first house we bought it sold because of the work we did on it like it was it went from like oh wow this is horrible to oh yeah i want this mm. Right. And so we, we made, we made a good chunk of change on that. And then our second house, just because of 
because of the economy and, and the way things changed, we bought low, sold high sort of situation, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so we have enough. Well, we had enough um, profit from both of those houses. And of course, paying the mortgage for 11, 12 years almost, it had enough that we could just, okay, we sold, we have enough money to build get to the point of hopefully this is habitable. Yeah. That's what uh, I was going to ask is how you're financing the project. Um, I wish we could do that. The, some of the lenders that I've talked to, we're in a similar situation. So we didn't make much on our first house, but the last one that we built, we ended up making a decent amount of equity. We had also paid it down a good bit. We'd only lived there seven years, but I know there was one year we reduced the principal by like 20 grand when I talk to some people, they're like, I wish I could do that. You know, how how do you, and I'm like, well, it wasn't by accident. Like we paid $20,000 down on the, on the mortgage. I mean, (laughs) it's an asset and you can reduce the principal by paying on it. That's. (laughs) We didn't eat out. We didn't eat out at restaurants every single night of the week. Correct. There's a lot of that that we do. And we look at and we're like, we can't justify, you know, doing this thing that everybody says is normal. We drive used cars that are paid for. We just can't justify, you know, so many people. I live right by one of the oldest Toyota plants in America. And they they make all the Camrys. The Toyota Camrys are made right here, like a mile from my house. And because of that, you know, they have a ton of people that work there. Well, they treat their workers right and they give them really good prices on new cars. But I'm still like, even if you got like cost, cost plus, you know, $300 or whatever they get, you know, invoice plus that's still a lot of money. I mean, I saw someone the other day that had two of the brand new Toyota Tundras, the big trucks sitting in their driveway. Those are 90 grand a piece. So they have a mortgage worth of vehicles sitting in their driveway, like more than my first house, my first house. I think we only paid like 130,000 for it or something like that. Now that sounds like nothing, you know, but 130 grand is a lot of money. Anyway, back to the, back to the equity thing. So we rolled a a bunch of that equity into this house here in the city. When, when we bought it, we saved some out for a down payment for some land because we knew we wanted to look and kind of, we're putting that plan in place. But, um, I don't know, maybe we should have, you know, kept more out to put down on, I don't, I don't know some of the lenders have asked, well, could you sell this house to get at all the equity, you know, to to have that kind of like you've done, but we're just not able to. So a couple of reasons I use my workshop for income. Um, I build things for income. I make content out there, that kind of thing. If we went and rented somewhere, I don't think a renter would be very happy with, you know, me setting up a workshop and, and doing things. If I could even find a place, you know what I mean? At this point I have enough tools and the power need, I mean, luckily we had a 400, 400 amp meter meter box here at the house and there was over 200 amps free. Oh, that's nice. So, but that's the, that's, but that's the kind of the stupid thing with banks though, right? Is like, well, you have all this equity in your house, so you have to sell it in order to get the equity. And then you have to go pay (laughs) more to live because you still have to live somewhere. It's going to be precisely that the rent around here for, you know, I have a family of five. So to, to be decently comfortable around here would probably be something like 23 to $2,500 a month. Yeah. Well, our mortgage is a thousand. How does that make sense? Cause that, that puts me in a worse cash, cash position as far as from a lender standpoint, I worked for banks for a long time from the lender standpoint, they want you to be able to pay the payment on a construction loan. Well, if I have double my monthly c- cash outlay that hurts me as far as being able to pay your payment but because of that we'll probably end up having to do a home equity line of credit temporarily you know like during the home build just to be able to access that equity because the equity in this house is basically what will build the next one kind of like what you're doing i just don't have it sitting in a pile and and you're sacrificing you know i mean you were talking about we don't go out to eat all the time. You were telling me in the pre-show, like how many of y'all are living in that little house with your with your folks? I mean, that's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice for them, for you, and everybody's yeah. cramped. Well, and... I mean, my my parents have their own house, so they they're not in here with us. But we're oh, gotcha. all, yeah. You know, my my wife and kids are, you know, there is five of us in this eight hundred square foot house, and so it's, it's that's small. 
it's crowded. I mean, it's cozy. Talking about talking about eating out and all that type of stuff, though. I don't, I've shared this a little bit on my social media, and I'm probably should talk about it more. But my wife has, and my wife has what's called histamine intolerance. Mm. So you know what histamines are, right? That's your allergic yeah. reaction stuff. So she's she's literally allergic to being allergic, essentially. Uh, so as her body produces hi- histamines, she has a reaction to that. Yeah. Yeah, and huh. so then anything that that raises histamine levels in your body triggers an an inflammatory response in her, and she gets like hives and and inflamed and blah blah blah. And so so any major source of histamines is dietary, mm-hmm. and so any food that, that's pre prepared because it's sitting there, there's bacterial action going on on it, breaking it down, increasing the level of histamines. Mm-hmm. So we basically can't eat out, right? And, uh, like we make, we make 99% of what we eat from scratch. Excuse me. I wouldn't say ours is that high, but we cook at home every night, you know, try to use fresh ingredients as, as often as possible. Obviously the, the breakfast is a, a little more grab and go. And then the kids are at school for lunch. So that's a little different, but i I feel her pain. I don't, I don't have that same type of response, but I'm <laughs> very familiar with histamines because I'm allergic to a lot of things. Like there's just a lot of stuff that bothers me. I, I end up, uh, the technical term is allergic rhinitis. It's hay fever. It's what people used to call it. I get that a time or two a year, every year. And people are like, oh, you got a cold or you have this or that. And I'm like, no, I've literally had this since I was 10 every year. Yeah. Well, a couple of years ago, um, I don't know. Were you following along last summer when we went on our long trip there? Uh, yeah, we, some. I know. I I know. I posted a bunch about it, but I don't know who all saw. But we so so I quit working last year because of my my hand injuries. And just prior to me quitting, my wife her issues kind of came to a head. At that point, mm-hmm. she was literally head to toe covered in in welts and rashes, an inch or two wide. They Goodness. put her on, on prednisone, a <laughs> double dose of Benadryl, and eight times the regular dosage of Claritin. How does she even stay awake? <laughs> that that's where she's she's kind of lucky that way because like twenty percent of people who take Benadryl get wired by it. And she it does both to, to me. The, oh, does it? Well, sometimes I can take Benadryl and I'm like a zombie. And then sometimes I can take it, I can't go to sleep for anything. So she she most of the time reacts like the she just gets wired by it, and, <laughs> but uh, yeah. But anyway, so so then since that point, like we were kind of trying to figure out some what's going on with her up to that point, but then that went over the over the top, and so since mm-hmm. then we've been trying to figure out, and that's where we've discovered this histamine intolerance stuff and and dietary and all that jazz. But it's been a whole adventure. But this actually kind of leads in. This is the question that I actually wanted to talk to you about now that we've, okay. you know, it's been the house building show. Huh. Uh, it's what we're both it, into right now. Well, I'm not building anything. I've just, I just talk about it. Just, just talk. Well, that's pretty much the same as me. I just talk <laughs> about doing it. But uh, anyway, I read a, this, now we're moving into the workshop therapy section of the podcast okay. here. I read a, I read a paper just recently and and I can't find it again. I just kind of randomly ran across it, and I don't remember the title of it or the authors or anything. Anyway, it was talking about social media and and couples' relationships, and it made this interesting correlation between between the amount that the spouse, the the social media spouse, would use their other their their partner as a part of their videos. Mm. And the correlation was the more that the spouse was shown in the videos, the 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 likelihood of their relationship was was going to be like. <laughs> and and so, I started thinking about all the people who who I know who are married. Um, I think your your anniversary, if I remember right, is somewhere pretty close to mine, right? I, I know we've in talked June? about it a couple of times. I don't remember. Mine's in April, June? or maybe maybe our, yeah, 
we've been married the same amount of time or whatever it is. We've had a couple conversations about it. Over yeah, the we've years, been married uh, 18 years. Yeah, that's what it is. 18 years. We've been married the same amount of time. That's what it, anyway. And then like, like Mark Spagnolo was another one that I've talked to and, and he's similar with his wife, Nicole, they, they, they don't show your, your significant other on screen very often. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but then you go to the other extreme and you see these people who are like prank on their wife sorts of shows. And, and it just mm-hmm. doesn't seem like they have the same sort of value of relationship. You know, does that make sense to you? It does. I wonder, I mean, we're, the, the paper or the study you were talking about was making that correlation between, you know, how it was showing the, the significant, significant other on screen or not. I wonder if it had as much to do, not, not just with them showing up on the social, but that person's personality and they don't want to be on screen. So I think you've said that's how it is with your wife. That's definitely how it is with my wife. She doesn't really like that. Now, on our Dirt to Done channel that I'm doing kind of around this building process, I'm trying to make it a little bit different, and I want her more a part of it. So I'm making her do that, but she still doesn't like it because I'm always like, will you do the intro for this one, or can you hop on a microphone and talk? Yeah, and so my uh, my thought on that was was like, how much how much do you respect your wife? Respect your partner in their wishes versus like, I'm going to just shove the camera in your face anyway and screw you, babe, sort of right. action, right? Well, no, it's definitely got to be something. I'm not going to do that if she's just adamant that she doesn't want to to be on something. Uh, the times that I've asked her like, hey, on this on this channel, I'd love to get you more involved. Can you help me do an intro or can you just be on mic? I can do most of the wrap up. We're talking about this project or we're out at the land saying something. I just... I like seeing her and and people say they like seeing her, but she's, um, I don't know all the specific personality types and stuff, but I would say she's definitely an introvert and, um, she's a school teacher, which is interesting because she can, she can be extroverted for that. And she's very good at it. And when she's in that role, she's like in, she's just going, you know, and you would never think she's an introvert. But that's why sometimes when she comes comes home, she's so spent because it it drains introverted people to have to be talking to people all the time. Yep. And uh, I think that's you know a lot of what drives. And I'm aware of that, so I'm like I don't try to make her be on camera that much. Yeah, and my wife is the same way. My, my wife's a teacher as well, and yeah, she's she's funny. I don't know if your wife is this way, but but my wife is really funny. She she's been offered a full time contract on every teaching job that she's had like before before the her temporary contracts over right which doesn't happen very often up here hmm. it's usually it's like oh well maybe we'll give you a contract every principal that she's had they've been like oh yeah i'd hire you in a heartbeat again i'll give you a recommendation wherever you want to go and 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 so she's she's good at her job she's a great teacher but then every time you talk to her about it, she's always like, no, I don't know. I'm, I'm doing terrible. You know, this mm-hmm. kid isn't perfect and this kid isn't perfect. And, and so it's very, very draining on her that way. But anyway, yeah, my wife, talk- just the other day, she had someone from, you know, the county board or whatever came in and did an evaluation and they don't tell you ahead of time. I mean, on purpose, cause they want to step in and just see how you're instructing and my wife teaches science. So a lot of it and the stuff that she loves is the applied stuff. Like when they can do an activity or they can, you know, have something physical that can help that concept click in the, in the young minds. And she said, yeah, they came in, did an evaluation. It happened to be the only 10 minutes out of the entire day that we were sitting there just having a discussion or whatever. She said, if they were to come in any other time, she would have seen the, the kids doing this and that. And it was the same thing. Like you said, she, she was just all worried about it. I was like, they yeah. know what kind of instruction you do. I'm sure it went fine. All, all her evaluations are good. Yeah. That's my wife was complaining about her last one here. Her principal came and and evaluated her and, and as the principal was leaving, she said, I hope you kids know that you have the best teacher in the entire division. And you should be grateful. And then, <laughs> and my wife was, she, she's like, what do you think she means like that? Yeah. Do you think I need to do something better? And it's like, she wasn't like, being sarcastic. No, like take it. It didn't have a double meaning. It was just, she meant <laughs> what she said. Anyway, it made me laugh. Yeah. But, but yeah, so I, I don't, I don't bring my wife into the social media and so that got me, I mean, I have her on here more often now, 
and she's kind of like the unofficial official co-host. So when I don't have a guest, we'll have a conversation because we're kind of doing our master's degrees in the same, same kind of general area right now, which is what, uh, so mine's clinical psychology and then she's doing a special education in, in neurodivergence education. So like autism and ADHD and that type of stuff. Right. And so we have a lot of back and forth conversations about things like that. And, and I enjoy talking to my wife. So I have her on here fairly frequently and we discuss, you know, creativity and, and, you know, different, different psychology type of conversations. But so on here, she seems to be a lot more comfortable. And and it was just, it's interesting to me that, that you see people who, who, I mean, social media wise and interaction wise, listening to your podcast and that type of stuff, it seems like you have a pretty good relationship with your wife. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, in conversations with people like Mark Spagnola that I've talked to, he, he's, he seems to have a really good relationship with his wife. And and I've talked to him about that as well. And he, he would say the same thing. And uh, it's, it's, I think it comes down to like a, going back to the, the social media study thing there. I think it comes down to like a respect for the other person and respect for their wishes, or maybe not, not throwing them out into the, into the public domain just for the views, because you know, you know, full well, if you put your wife's face on a thumbnail versus your face, your wife's face is going to get better click through. Oh, yeah. Right. Way better. Like no offense. Your wife looks better than you. Well, she does. That's no offense taken. (laughs) Yeah. It reminds me of that. It's almost become become a meme at this point, but whatever the channel is, it's, it's like a sawmill woodworking channel. And he always uses his wife in these tights and she has like her butt at the camera for the thumbnail or whatever. But now people stitch it, you know, and they'll, they'll, some guy will be doing that and have his like butt pointed at the camera and say, this is my planer and it's the such and such. But you know, it's that same principle. Of course that that guy's getting clicks on his videos because of it. And it's, it's a frustrating reality. Yeah. And uh, (laughs) yeah. So kind of continuing on workshop therapy, then what would you say would be the key to your successful relationship so far? Like as, as a husband, what have you done right? I think it started a long time ago and I think it, it was basically what I think everybody should do before you get married is talk about your beliefs and your expectations about marriage and, and come to some kind of an agreement. Now, obviously that stuff has changed over the last 18, 19 years, but you know, we, we had an agreement about how we were going to act toward each other and around other people and in regards to kids or in regards to like we were talking about debt or all of those things matter. Like how are we going to treat money? And I think that's been the the foundation of it. Um, just setting those expectations and, and living up to it. You know what I mean? Like if I said I was going to do this to try to set that expectation and then I go against that, that would be a betrayal toward her of that's a bait and switch. Like you, you wouldn't even do that. You would really wouldn't do that as a, as a human to another human, but especially not somebody that you say you love and you're in a relationship with. Um, and you know, you don't always get it right. Obviously you don't get to be married as long as you and I have been without when you mess up, you apologize and you own up to it and say, I'm sorry for this. And it's something that I try to teach my kids like for it to be an apology you need to tell how you're going to change going forward. Like if, if you're truly sorry, you know, that that's the repentant part. That's the, the feeling regret and saying, Hey, I messed up. But then you have to outline going forward. I plan on doing this differently. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I would say is those basic things we put in place a long time ago. And it manifests itself in some silly ways. Like, um, I've always cleaned the toilets always in our house. I don't know why, but you know, you talk about, Oh, well there's traditional roles and do this and that and that. We, we have some things like my wife cooks more than I do. I cook some, but I hate dirty dishes and she knows that. And so she does most of the dishes. It's just something we've always done. I hate doing dishes. 
and I help in other ways. Yeah, I think that's 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 an important thing to to remember. Traditional roles may have had some validity for for whatever reason. You know, in the past, there may have been some valid reason for all of these traditional roles, and 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 it's not to say that they don't still have some sort of validity now too. But I don't think that that I don't think you need to do this because you're a woman and you need to do this because you're a man is a, is a, a valid reason to assign tasks anymore. I don't think that's a relationship up very well. Yeah. Whereas like you said, is <laughs> I hate doing dishes. Therefore, you know, if you don't mind doing dishes, I will do something that you hate that I don't mind. And, uh, and vice versa. Right. And so, yeah, some of those traditional roles, like, I'm definitely not in a traditional role right now, for sure, because I'm the one that's at home with the three-year-old. Mm-hmm. Part of that is because it makes more sense for my wife to go to work, because if I go to work, I'm going to make less money than I'm going to make off of my disability insurance. So, mm. you know, that that's... And if I go to work, my hands will start hurting more again. But right. anyway, but so we're, you know, our our, our roles have changed throughout time and and being flexible with that and being understand understanding of your partner's needs Mm -hmm. versus versus just well this is my role and this is the role i'm going to fulfill end of story yeah and all of that gets talked you know got talked about before we got married so there was an understanding of what i did and didn't like me as a person and same with her and as like you said, as roles have changed, like I have in the past made more money than my wife as far as career, but there have been times like right now, she makes more money than I do. Like you were just talking about, uh, I'm self-employed and I'm like doing this little thing and this thing and this thing. And, but I'm way happier than I was when I was working in corporate America, you know, for a, a mid-sized bank. It was just horrible. I mean, I remember one time I came home and my oldest son, I don't remember how old he was at this point. It was probably like 2018 or 2019. So five years ago ish, he was probably eight or nine. And he just said something like, you're always unhappy when you come home. I I wish he would just be happy. You know, talking about when I come home from work, well, that's a pretty big, uh, you know, that's a pretty big observation. And, you know, you have to change that, but it's also not always easy. Like I do have that built in me. I kind of came from a real traditional household where, you know, the mom stays at home and the dad makes the money, even though my mom's had some jobs also later in life. But you know, when I'm not making as much as my wife, she and I have conversations about that. I talk to her because it bothers me at a deep level sometimes. And I don't really know what that is, but we still talk about it, you know? Yeah. We, we've had that conversation. Like I'm, I'm very happy for my wife and I'm very proud of her and she's a wonderful person and, and I love her very much. But the, yeah, that there is that background. Like, I feel like a failure in my in my role, even though we've discussed this. That it's not my role right at the moment. Mm-hmm. Feel like I'm failing in my role as a as a breadwinner and as as a provider. Mm-hmm. Like you said, that that background. I don't know where it comes from, but I, you know, same as you. My dad was the breadwinner. My mom stayed at home, and and you, and so you have that in the background of like, this is my role, and I'm failing at my role. Mm -hmm. but uh, I think that's where uh, the discussion around money is important because I see a lot of people, a lot of couples now, uh, they don't seem to be on the same page with that. And some of them even have separate bank accounts, which I I just can't fathom because, and, and I'm tying this together with what you and I were talking about with the role of, it's not that it's a competition. It's not like I'm competing with my wife that I feel like I need to make more money. That's not really what it is. It is kind of a, I guess, feels like a like a man thing. Like I need to prove this. I don't really have to prove anything. But the biggest thing is it's our money. It's not my money that I earn and her money that she earns. It's our money. So if I'm making more at one point, it's our money. And if she's making more at one point, it's still our money and the mortgage is our mortgage. And the the financial decisions are both of ours. We both get an equal say no matter what. And however that changes over the years, as far as income, it doesn't matter because we both have an equal say with what we want to spend our money on. Yeah. We, my wife and I actually just recently got interviewed by someone 
about they had a they had an assignment from their from their professor that they needed to interview somebody that they thought had a successful marriage or felt that they had a successful marriage and so they asked they asked us their their to interview us and and which which was gratifying i guess yeah but so she sent us these these questions this questionnaire and 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 the uh one of the first questions is what is the single biggest decision that you have made that has contributed to your success as a couple? And independently, my wife and I both wrote the same thing. Hmm. And it, and it's kind of, it's kind of funny to think about it because it's a kind of an incidental decision that we both made. But, but when we first got married, our first Christmas together you know of course your your parents are on both sides are oh come see us for christmas oh come Mm -hmm. see us for christmas right and and we discussed it and we we made the decision together that we were going to spend our first christmas together with just ourselves just us Mm -hmm. we weren't starting your own tradition exactly this is like this this first christmas will be our christmas because we're establishing that we're a couple and and then there's no well you went to their house for the first christmas you need to come to our house for the next mm-hmm. christmas sort of and that was that was kind of the 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 thought process right is we just didn't want to start with the requirement of well you went there that and now you have to come to us and that's that's all it was but but since then it has it has evolved into this we made that decision because we wanted to establish ourselves as us and and then that that attitude carried forward into all of the decisions that we have made since then mm-hmm. is it's we still are making you this decision. Both. exactly because it's us not well i want to go see my family and so or you want to go see your family it's what do we want to do correct no. yeah um, we had a we had a similar thing that i think early on really bonded us um, we got married in 06 and we decided we weren't going to jump in and try to own a house immediately and get into debt and this and that. I had some student loan debt and she had some student loan debt. I think together it was about $20,000, which nowadays sounds like chump change. I mean, a lawnmower at Lowe's is five grand, you know? So when you, when you put it into that perspective, it does not sound like a lot of money, but in 06, 20 grand was a lot of money. And we looked at each other and went, we're going to go rent an apartment. It's not what we want ideally, but it was basically like a challenge for us as a couple. And I think it really bonded us. We went, we are going to just hunker down and pay off this debt. And we threw everything we could at that debt. We got a a decent little apartment and we cooked a lot and we hung out and we didn't, you know, go do a ton of entertainment stuff. We didn't go eat out. We played card games and this and that. And we still look back fondly on that first year. We paid it off in 10 months. And so it it was like this challenge that we looked at each other and went, okay, we're in this together, you know, challenge accepted. We're going to pay this off. And, and we did. And, and it's kind of like you, you were saying now, even later, you still go, we can do this together. We can do this. So when we come across something else, whether it's financial or not, we kind of look at each other and went, we even this year, we'll look at each other and go, well, we can do this. We've done these other things. And together we have, we've done all of these things. So it, it basically gave us that mentality of together, we can do anything. It sounds kind of cheesy. Yeah. But, but that's, that's, that's really what it comes down to though, right? Is, is your, you're, you're making that commitment to the other person and, and saying, it's not about me and it's not about you. I think that's the important thing too, to remember it's mm-hmm. not about me and it's not about you. It's about us. And that's, that's the, actually, uh, my, my current, this is probably why my thoughts patterns are where they are right now is because my current, my current master's class is, is family and couples therapy. Mm. So I'm obviously thinking about but <laughs> another one of the papers that I read recently is that relationship balancing act, right? And when you have, there's a dysfunctional relationship is when either party is receiving more focus for than than the couple is and so mm-hmm. you can have you can have the one person submitting everything to the will of the other person that's obviously dysfunctional right or you can have 
one person voluntarily saying, I love you so much, I'm going to support you 100% and suppress my own needs. You know, so the other person isn't forcing that on them. Mm-hmm. That's still dysfunctional. And, and and as long as as long as the one person either party, as long as either party is focusing a hundred percent on the other party and not on the the them, the us aspect of it, right. It has a higher risk of being a dysfunctional relationship. Hmm. Yeah, even, I can see even that. if it is yeah, even because if it is like a, a self sacrificing, I'm wonderful because I'm I'm supporting you a hundred percent and the other person is supporting the other person a hundred percent, that's still creating conflict because it's mm-hmm. focusing on one individual instead of the couple. I've never <laughs> I won't say never. I've rarely had that problem just because I do believe, you know, in a relationship, in a marriage, you should be able to say, you know, say tough things and and guess what? Arguments happen. That doesn't mean it shouldn't happen. Now they should be resolved and you should, you should both come back together. Like I was talking about, my mom told me this years ago, just old school, you know, don't let the sun go down on, on your angry. Don't on your being angry at at one another. Don't go to bed angry. And we've kept that for a long time, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak up if it's something that, Hey, I I really need this or whatever, but I, I totally agree with you. Obviously you have to sacrifice for each other. That's what, I mean, that's what we were talking about earlier of doing those duties. You know, she probably doesn't love doing dishes either, but she sacrificed because she knows I hate it. And then I do, you know, I do all the mowing or the yard work or whatever. And she could probably do it, but she doesn't like, I hate it less than her. You know what I mean? So it's like, I kind of sacrifice and do that. But I see what you're talking about. You can't sacrifice all of you or the entity then ends up hurting because it, it's just not healthy. I, I don't see it being yeah. healthy. Yeah. I think your, your advice that you were given about never go to bed angry. I've, I've, I've received that same advice myself, mm-hmm. but the, the caveat to that, that I think people who are just entering marriage or, or people who, who, you know, this is the first time that you've heard this and it's great advice because it is great advice. The caveat is if you don't, don't go to bed angry at your spouse. That does mean that you're probably going to have a couple sleepless nights. Right. But it's important. Well, and the other thing might be don't go to bed angry. That doesn't mean that issue is totally resolved. You know, you can, you can come back together and, and apologize if you said things you shouldn't have or whatever, and you're not angry at each other, but you could still have a disagreement ongoing about a particular issue or whatever. I could see that being being separate you know what i mean like we're not angry at each other but we're going to talk about this again at some point exactly well we should probably wrap up here it's been a while okay but yeah thanks for coming on bruce i really appreciate it and yeah uh, enjoyed it. tell everybody where you can be found and and your podcast and all that type of stuff i meant to talk more about that than i did but uh, obviously you're going to get a whole lot of listeners from me yeah uh i have done a podcast for years now called we built a thing it's a loosely a woodworking podcast um i do it with two other guys one's in minnesota and one's in michigan and we've done it now for about five years so we've got a couple almost 300 episodes now and it's just the three of us sitting down we loosely like i said talk about projects we're working on uh videos we're posting to youtube around woodworking or whatever but we're also all dad so get mixed in with uh parenting stuff and different things that we're getting into we we try to make it just a conversation and not strictly uh, focused on certain projects but um, yeah you could find me or the podcast pretty much anywhere i have a youtube channel it's just my name i was real creative it's just bruce a ulrich but i'm trying to get back more into the habit this year with a lot of the house stuff i've just really slacked on um, doing a lot of videos on that channel so trying to get back into the, there is an actual habit in, in publishing, you know, like videoing and publishing. And then you have to like build this muscle back up because I'm good at filming it and kind of archiving it and going, Oh, okay, well I'll have some content and this and that. And you just get busy with life and you look up and you're like, Oh, I have all this stuff that I've filmed and I've never actually put it together and put it out there. But yeah, yeah, I appreciate you having me on. It's uh, been a good discussion. Yeah, enjoyed talking to you. And let's uh, let's head on over to the after show. Gather around and lend your ears.
private tale, the tale of noble souls, the founding fathers of the workshop therapy podcast. Like the sturdy stones of the highlands, they stand firm. Their craft and spirit steeled against the fiercest winds, guiding us on the path of creation. First, Matthew from Argiano Serio, a craftsman whose skull is as timeless as the hills. He guards his mark with hands steady as a highland lock, bringing forth beauty like the first light of dawn on Ben Nevis. Then, there's Brad of Brad's customs, whose touch is the forge's kiss, hot and unyielding. His work stands tall as a castle wall, each piece crafted with the strength the clans united, his spirit a fiery beacon. Next comes Keith from Blackthorn Concepts, wise as an old sage. His designs are sharp as Claymore's blade, elegant yet mighty, carving a place in the world that nay fade with time. And let us nay forget Eric, hailing from overall makerworks, a creator rooted deep in the earth, as works solid as a stone, growing strong and proud. His craft lifts us all like the broad trees of a highland glen. Then we have Brandon of tectonic creations, whose spirit moves mountains, whose designs rumble through the land like thunder on a stormy night, leaving a trail of awe in their week. Finally, mighty Grant Alexander, a craftsman whose dedication rings across the locks and moors like the clash of steel, a warrior in a battle of creativity, whose support lifts us like the Highlands Piper's tune. To ye, our noble founding fathers, we give our deepest thanks, with gratitude as boundless as the island sky. If ye, too, wish to support the Workshop Therapy podcast and journey with us, come, join us on Patreon where tales of resilience, skill, and spirit run as deep as the roots of Scotland herself. Och, gather round once more, for there is one more soul that must be honoured in this hail of legends. The one and only Bryce, the Waffle Beaver. Aye, he's no mere mortal. He's a marvel, a maker a legend whose craft is as rare as thistle in bloom. Bryce, the waffle beaver, brings forth creations as warm and hearty as a highland feast on a winter's eve. With hands swift and steady, he spins syrup and batter into masterpieces, the kind that stick to your ribs and your heart alike. They say the scent of his craft rolls across the hills, like the mist on Loch Lomond, calling to all who hunger for flavour and fellowship. From far and wide, folks come to see the works of Bryce, whose waffles bear the soul of the highlands, sweet as honey, and bold as the stag on the hill. To ye, Bryce, the waffle beaver, we raise our cups and offer a cheer that echoes across the glens and valleys. May your waffles ever be golden, your heart ever bold, and your craft celebrated with the pride of Scotland herself.